Hello everyone! Welcome to another wonderful Aquarium Online Academy. Our goal today is to talk a little bit about seals, sea lions, and conservation. So with that, we'd love to have you participate. Uh, my name is Jen, and then I also have a few others that are going to be joining us in participating in this class today. I have Stacy, who's going to be showcasing much of the imagery back behind me. Then we also have Amanda at our computer, bringing any kind of questions, comments that you might have. And so if you're wondering how you can participate, feel free to go on ahead and text right on in to our number down here below, 562-286-1838. Feel free to text in your questions, comments. We'd love to hear from you, and we always really enjoy your participation within our class. Now, if you happen to be watching this later, uh, let's just say not Friday the 25th, 26th, I was close, at 10 a.m., you're always more than welcome to email down below at live at lbaop.org. Now, with this, I have chosen to start us out here in our lovely blue cavern exhibit, though I must say that our giant sea bass right here are trying to steal the show as usual. Uh, but what we have here is a depiction of our California coast right here. Oh, our eel looks like it wants in on the action too. It's like, me, me. Now, with this, right, here we have a really cool environment, um, especially for those of you that may not be familiar with diving into a local kelp forest scene here. Um, we in California are very lucky to be able to have this kind of ecosystem. It's actually one of like five-ish or so that are found around the world. So it's a really unique one. And the animals that we're going to be talking about today, though focus on a lot of this kelp forest habitat, a lot of these animals and the functions and the roles that they serve within a food web or a food chain are still going to be fairly similar. And so our goal today is to talk a little bit about how marine mammals like seals and sea lions um, where they kind of fit in, what are some of those differences? Um, and many of them off of the California coast here live in our kelp forest habitat. So thought we'd start us off here. But let's go on ahead and let's look at, um, see, so let you pick seal or sea lion of your choice. But as we go on ahead and check it out, right, let's go on ahead and let's talk a little bit about marine mammals, right? Let's start with the basics. Here we have a great picture of two of California sea lions here. And with that, well, what do you notice? They are mammals, right? So this is just kind of to give us inspiration about sea lions as mammals. Hmm, are there any kind of general characteristics that come to mind for you? I know for me, right, we are related to these marine mammals because we are mammals ourselves. Only difference for us as mammals being on land and marine mammals is pretty much where they're, where foods they like to eat right, and where they're located. So animals such as our sea lion friends right here love to eat fish and other things that we'll get a chance to talk about, but they do live in the water. So anything sparks your mind about what makes a mammal a mammal? Hmm. Well, for me, one big hint, are there snoots right here? You almost want to boop them, right? Boop. And then boop right there, right? They are air breathers. And so are we, right? So it's a shared feature between us mammals is that we use our lungs to be able to breathe air, right? Another thing that may be tricky to see is that they have fur. Now here's with this picture, they just recently came out of the water. So it's a little bit tricky to see, but they have fur or hair on them, much like how we do on our heads. Uh, so that is another shared feature amongst us. Now, what might be another one? Hmm. Well, if you're thinking warm-blooded, absolutely, right? So these animals, even though maybe sometimes us, we like to just kind of lounge around on warm surfaces, much like my cats, uh, you know, these animals don't necessarily rely on the heat to keep them moving, to keep them going, right? We have things like our warm blood um, and extra sweaters and stuff that we can use to keep our body warmth in, right? So these sea lions are a great example of that too. We're not like a lizard that needs to kind of warm up on a rock before we can really start moving and grooving and have a good day, right? So our, our blood is warm. Hmm. So we've gone ahead and listed three of the five features, right? We mentioned that they breathe air, they have fur hair on their body somewhere, and that we are warm blooded. There's two more to go. Can you think of what they might be? Hmm mammals. 
Ah, well, if you're thinking, drinks milk? Yes, right? So that is an example of that. Um, and so many of these animals, uh, these seals included, right, go on ahead and they drink milk, just like how we do when we're born. Leads us to our fifth one, live birth, right? We don't come out of an egg. This cute little seal right here does not come out of an egg, right? So mammals give live birth. Now, of course, there's always an exception or two, right? Ah, oh, here's a cute little baby seal from our, our aquarium, actually. This is Kaya, if I'm not mistaken excuse me if I'm not mistaken, um, and she is one of our baby seals, and you saw her dad just a little bit ago, Troy. And so, you know, live birth right here. Can't get much cuter than this, right? So those are generally the five characteristics that make up a mammal a mammal, and it's kind of cool to think that we share these features with these animals that live out in the ocean, right? So now we're looking at right now seals and sea lions, and I know Miss Amador's class is asking, what are the differences between seals and sea lions, right? And are they cousins? They are cousins of a sort, as these animals are considered pinnipeds, meaning a flipper or feather-footed, right? So if we go ahead and we look, we can see their cute little appendages right there, and they are kind of flippery of nature, right? And so that's how they, they are cousin-esque, and they, they do share those features. Now here we have a very cute seal right here. Um, and so this is a harbor seal. So what do you notice on our harbor seal? I'll just give you a minute. If you want to bring in some observations, we'd love to hear from you. And it looks like we do have some questions that are popping up. So as you make your observations, I'll get to some of these questions and comments. Brayden's asking, have any baby seals or sea lions been born at AOP at our aquarium? Yes, as a matter of fact, we've had three baby seals. Mm -hmm. Kaya's are our newest, but the other two, I believe, have gone to other institutions. So now they're at other zoos or aquariums, enjoying their lives, having a grand old time, making lots of new friends, and I'm sure making lots of new family members too, right? So here we have uh, Troy, who's actually been the father, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to all three of them. So Troy has been a lovely dad uh, to be able to have her around to father those three seals. Aaron's asking, do they sleep? with their eyes closed? Mm, that is a good question. Now, with these animals, they actually can sleep with their eyes closed. Um, and so they can sleep beautifully, just like that, right? So here's another harbor seal who is sleeping um, on a rock that's enjoying the sun, though warm-blooded, right? Still kind of relaxing there and maybe being out of any harm's way of any sort of predator uh, that may be around. And Yasmin's asking, do baby seals and sea lions stay with their moms or have an instinct to go on their own like a shark? Oh, great question, Yasmin. Now, they do spend some time with their mom because uh, much like mammals, right, we are large animals and we need a little bit of extra investment time. So that means, you know, getting extra care from our moms, uh, drinking milk from our moms, and really kind of getting a chance to learn a little bit about, well, how to be a seal or how to be a sea lion, right? So Kaya was one um, that definitely spent a lot of time with mama for a period of time and was able to kind of drink milk and get big enough before she was able to really kind of be completely on her own. Ah, oh, thank you, Stacy. Now here's a lovely video of mama and baby together. And this is of course when Kaya was much younger. And so you can see they have a lovely bond together, just getting a chance to, to hang out and to nurse. Oh, so cute. I could watch this all day. Just get me a nice big bowl of popcorn. I'll eat popcorn at 9 a.m. Can you tell I'm a big popcorn fan? Mm, delicious. But it's not about popcorn today. It's about these cute little animals right here. These seals, right? So some features that I'm noticing on these seals is, of course, they have really large eyes, right? And behind those eyes, if you can take a note, it's a little bit tricky to see on Kaya here, but really easy to see on Mama, that little hole behind that head is actually where their ears are. Now, they don't have ear flaps like you or I, right? So if you go on ahead and you would look at your ear, right, we have an ear flap. These animals right here, right, don't necessarily have that ear flap. They just have an ear hole. Pretty interesting, right? So, and if we look at the color of our animal, right, kind of has this really cool speckled model color, a little bit of black, a little bit of white, um, and it has a very interesting pattern that's to it too, right? Any other observations that you might make? Hmm. 
Well, something that I definitely noticed is that with these seals, right, a lot of times you see them kind of plop, right? They're just kind of on the ground. They're enjoying themselves. They have these long flippers at the very front that really kind of help them to, to move around. We've seen them more stationary, right? We've seen them more just kind of hanging out, kind of flopping down right there. Um, and so they have more of a, a wormy kind of body overall that's speckled, that has those little flippers down on the bottom with these big eyes, big nose, and those ears, right? Those ear holes, basically. Now, if we go ahead and we look at a sea lion, be interesting to think about what do you think some differences you might notice here? I'll step out of the screen so you can get a nice view. We have two lovely sea lions here that are present. Now, as you make some observations, we did get some more questions. So loving the participation. Um, from Mason, we got a question of what do you call a group of seals or sea lions? That would be a raft, a raft of seals or sea lions. Ah, so cute. And then do seals live together in the ocean? So that's what Darlene is asking and sea lions too. And that is a great question. As a matter of fact, that's kind of one of the differences between the two. Now we're seeing, you know, we saw two of our, our sea lions together, though that was within our aquarium here. But for the most part, seals like to be more on the solitary side versus sea lions like to be more in groups. So they're more of the, the group interaction, more playful kind of group. I kind of think of them as like dogs almost um, versus seals are kind of more like cats. They like to hang out by themselves, kind of, you know, chill one on one, just kind of be a little bit more mellow in that regard. Now, as a matter of fact, these sea lions also bark too. So that's another difference. Seals, they're very quiet. Sea lions will bark like ar, 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 sort of a thing, right? And so that would be our sea lions. They're very vocal animals. Um, and so, and if we look at this too, right? Some other things that we might notice between a seal and a sea lion is are those ear flaps. Now, sea lions have ear flaps just like how we do. Um, and they also have those big eyes like we notice within our seals, big noses like we notice within our seals, but what about the color that we're seeing here? Hmm. Do you see much of a pattern on them? Not so much, right? So they have more of a chocolatey brown or almost black coloration to them. And they're pretty much one solid color, right? We're not seeing lots of different kinds of patterns or speckles on them like we did with our seal. And it's really tricky to see, but here, it almost looks like one long, big neck, right? But believe it or not, these animals have their flippers too, right? Because they're both pinnipeds, but they can actually kind of sit up and stand up, right? They're not on the floor. Oh, this is a great picture, right? You can see them kind of sitting up um, and they can really move around very ad like agilely. On, on the ground, right? So they can, I made up a word today. So they can go on ahead and really move a little bit easier using all of these front flippers. So their movements is actually going to be a little bit different uh, than the seals themselves. So very interesting, right? Even though they're similar, they're cousins, there's definitely some different features about these animals. Now we did get a question of what are their favorite foods? And it really depends. But for the most part, overall, they like to eat fish. They like to eat squid. Now, sometimes they even like to eat crab, depending upon the animal. And that can be very important, right? These animals are kind of, you know, in the upper part of the food chain, but they definitely have really interesting impacts on the food chain down below. So with these animals, if they're eating fish, if they're eating squid, if they're eating crabs, right, or maybe like a clam or something like that, how do you think, how do you think they're important? Like, how does that, how does that help the environment? Hmm. Well, if you're thinking they're really good at just kind of making sure that all of those clam or those crab, those fish, those squid, or their populations are in, and their numbers are in check, you are correct, right? So they are kind of the, the gatekeepers of those animals, making sure that there's not too many of them, right? Now, on the opposite end, if you are a predator trying to eat a seal or a sea lion, what kind of predator would you be? What kind of animal would like to eat these ones right here? Hmm. Any thoughts? If you're thinking maybe a shark, right? 
Absolutely. So sharks might be one. Um, if we're thinking a little bit more up north for different populations, maybe polar bears, maybe orcas, right? And so they're really important food sources for those larger predators too that are kind of the top predators. So they're really important kind of being in that, in that middle area right there. Now, interestingly enough, the way that these animals get food and kind of how they process food is very important too. If you think about it, right, we all eat, but then we all have to go to the bathroom, right? And so their waste is actually really important in the nutrients that are being recycled in the ocean. Not only is it their waste that's important in recycling, but anytime that they turn over a rock, a smaller rock here within our kelp forest ecosystem, that is also bringing up any kind of trapped nutrients that are underneath rocks. And that really helps all of the, well, the algae to thrive. Yeah, pretty cool, right? That's a really interesting way and a unique way to kind of think about how sea lions also help all of these, you know, these large algae that are found with all right off of our coast, like the kelp forest that we were just in at the very beginning and right here. But it also helps the microscopic algae too, the base of the entire food chain. So it all kind of recycles and they all kind of benefit one another. So these sea lions and sea lions, very important animals. Now, so Nick, you did ask about if seals and sea lions have predators. So hopefully we answered that question for you, right? Orcas, potentially some bears, polar bears, and then also some sharks as well. Now, we did get a question of how do you tell the difference between a male and a female seal? Now, seal, it can be tricky as they are pretty similar in regards to their looks. So that one's a little trickier to tell. They are somewhat similar in size. Um, so it, it's a little bit trickier than the seals, but the sea lions, that can be a little bit easier. Our uh, biggest seal, sea lion that we happen to have is Parker, right here. Now there's a younger male right over here, um, but basically one way that you could tell the difference between a seal, I'm sorry, a seal, male seal lion is by that bump that's right on top of their head right here. That's called sagittal crest. And that sagittal crest is just a larger lump of muscle that they have that showcases, I am a large dominant male, right? And so these younger sea lions right here don't necessarily have that sagittal crest quite yet. And females don't have it at all. So a lot of times young males and females may look similar, though there is a definite size uh, difference between the males and the female sea lions. And as a matter of fact, California sea lions can grow up to the male ones 880. 80 pounds. Is that incredible? Oh, that's so large. Females, not as large, right? So there is what we like to call sexual dimorphism, right? Getting a chance to see some of those major differences between the males and the females, at least within sea lions. Seals, like I said, a little bit trickier. All right. Now we did get a question of what are the differences between the seals uh, between sea lions and fur seals. Um, and so this is a little bit, this is our a different kind of seal. I don't think we have any pictures of fur seals, but at least you can gain inspiration between the two. Uh, they are both part of the eared seals family. So they definitely have these little ears, um, the fur seals do. And fur seals are much hairier and um, actually they have like longer, bushier fur. So hopefully that helps. Um, you know, many of these seals and sea lions, though they are, they do have shared characteristics. You know, they always look a little bit different and have special adaptations for the particular environment that they're in. So, for instance, um, a lot of those seals that may need to live up further up north, right? They may have extra body fat on them or they may have additional fur, right? And so they'll find different adaptations to be able to really help them to stay warm. So that's definitely um, one way. Now here uh, with our California sea lions, one strategy that they help to keep themselves nice and warm if they're out in the ocean and there's no place to kind of haul up on a rock to get warm from the sun is they can do something um, with their flippers, right? So we said that these pinnipeds are, have these little flippers, right? Or large flippers. So what seals can, sea, sea lions can actually do is they can put a flipper out above on top of the water and they can just float with just that one flipper out in the water. Almost makes you think there's a shark, but it's just that flipper. And with that flipper right there, they're able to get the warmth from the sun 
and that sun warms up that flipper. Oh, that's cool. Thanks, Stacey. I didn't realize we have this. So with this flipper, right, you, you could just see all these little flippers. And you're like, what are you doing, sea lion? But what they're actually doing is they are using the sun, at least what little there is of it, and they are warming up the blood within that flipper. And they have something called countercurrent heat exchange, where they're actually able to send that blood around and they're able to warm up the rest of their blood just from the flipper right here. Isn't that cool? So it's a really unique and neat adaptation that these sea lions have. Seals don't really have that adaptation. But if you ever see this out on a boat, more than likely, it's a sea lion that is warming itself up. Uh, we did get another question of, do seals and sea lions get sick? And as a matter of fact, they can get sick. There's a lot of different ways in which these animals can get sick. Now, one particular way that definitely affects some of the animals off our California coast are through toxic algal blooms. So there are microscopic algae, and some of them are great, and some of them can cause harm to animals. Now, we did mention that these seals and these sea lions like to eat fish as one of their main food sources. Now, through the process of these toxins moving up the food chain through all these different animals, all of those fish that these seals and sea lions eat, um, these fish have a lot of these toxins in them, and guess who ends up being sick from those toxins? Our seals and our sea lions. Um, our sea lions in particular have some, can get something called domoic acid toxicity, which is just basically a type of toxin that causes memory loss, um, can cause them to be a little woozy, can even cause you know some, some seizures in animals. So it can be, depending upon the amount of toxin that these end up eating from all those fish, it can be a real problem. But fortunately, there are lots of organizations that are around to be able to help these animals that may be dealing with some of these sicknesses, right? And so these different organizations are able to take these animals in and take care of them the best that they can. So that's just one example of how they could get potentially get sick. So thank you for asking. That's a really good question. Now, thinking about it, right, a lot of these, um, a lot of these, kind of changes or problems that some of these animals have, whether they get sick, right? A lot of that comes from human pollution that comes, the runoff that basically comes off of our land and gets dumped into our ocean, right? Here off of Southern California, many times it doesn't rain a whole lot. So a lot of different kinds of pollution builds up in our environment. Some of that may be trash, some of that may be like, you know, pesticides or herbicides. Um, and so all of that basically when it rains, gets flushed into our waters here and it can do a whole lot of different kinds of things depending upon the types of pollution, right? Um, and so with that, one, one repercussion, right? One thing that ends up happening is that our algal, our algae that lives in the water can become toxic and that can really kind of spur some of the sicknesses that we might see, see in seals or sea lions. But other times, you know, depending upon the nutrients, it might be good. It might be great for algae here. That is really the promoter of an entire ecosystem, right? So it's all about kind of that fine balance and understanding, you know, how humans impact our oceans. Now, so another way that humans have impact our oceans is by getting a chance to, um, you know, sometimes hunt some of these animals for their potential fur, or maybe to just try to get rid of them because guess what? They're eating fish, they're eating squid, they're eating the same things that fisher folk are also trying to get, right? And so because of their decline due to human influence, there's been something called the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and that was uh, brought into play at about 1972 or so. And that act is a way to be able to protect these animals to make sure that their populations are stable so that way they can once again kind of be that regulator of making sure that fish populations, squid populations, and crab populations don't get too out of hand. And then also, right, being able to be that food source for all of those predators that we discussed earlier. Earlier. Now, Nick is asking, how long do seals live on average? And they can live anywhere between 25 to 30 years. As for sea lions, they also can live about that, about 20 to 30 years. So here we have a really nice video of sea lions as they're playing around and maybe foraging and turning over rocks, right? So you can see them, they're very playful. They like to hang out with each other, right? This nice raft of sea lions, and it really allows them to 
to hang out and really kind of churn up the water, right? And bring up those nutrients that many of these seagrasses and these algae can use. All right, loving the participation. Thank you, friends, for all the questions and comments that you might have. Now, something else that's really important, right, as we go on ahead and we talk about human influence is the ways in which we can affect our, our own ecosystems or our own backyard. So here we have, once again, our blue cavern exhibit, and this is actually an example of a marine protected area. If you're not familiar with marine protected areas, they are actually like a, an underwater national park, if you will, right? So these are protected areas, just like how they are on land. This is the underwater version. And so these are areas where many of the animals, like our giant sea bass and our other fun friends, our eels, right, our fish, are able to have a safe place for them to be able to live and to grow up and to have babies. And so these populations are protected. And once, you know, their populations are happy and healthy, that bleeds out to the rest of the, the surrounding areas where other populations can live happy and healthy. So these marine protected areas are super important for us to have. Now, Bree is asking, where do most seals live in the world? And there is about 18 species of true seals, um, and most of them will live in cold coastal waters all around the world, uh, but especially in the Arctic. So that's a big place for them. And many of that is, much of that is due to the nutrients that are found within those environments, right? So they're really rich, um, and it's really able to provide a nice stable habitat for many of these animals, right? And so if we think about it though, regardless of where they are, they're still eating fish. And a lot of times, as we mentioned earlier, we eat fish too, right? So within marine protected areas, you can't really fish there. It's like I said, it's a protected area, but you can fish pretty much anywhere outside of these marine protected areas. And something that, you know, we, something that may be helpful if you want to be able to help these seals and sea lions and other marine animals is kind of try to think about where do you consume your fish? I'm not talking about like, you know, at, at a restaurant, but I'm talking about location, right? Where does fish come from, right? Does it come from you know, uh, sources and areas that we know are responsible ways to be able to eat, right? Um, we like to call this looking at eating sustainably, right? So how, what's a way that we can ensure that as we eat our fish, that these fish that are being caught, their populations are kept sustainable, that they are kept to the level that is happy and healthy for these animals and the environment that they live in. Also, is the environment, you know, getting impacted by the way that these animals are being fished, right? And so understanding where your seafood comes from and the way that it's actually being harvested is really important and a really helpful way that you can help many of these populations. Heck, even sharks, right? Or any kind of other animal that you like. Fish are very important in this ecosystem as a whole, right? And so eating sustainable seafood is a great way to do that. And if you're wondering, how can I go about making sure that I'm eating seafood responsibly? Feel free to go on ahead and check out our Seafood for the Future website. And that can help start the conversation and help you figure out how to go about eating a little bit more sustainably or ways that you can also support these fisheries, right? Because we are, are definitely all on this together, especially even being on land or in the ocean, we're all interconnected together. Now, Miss Amador's class is asking, has the aquarium ever taken injured seals or sea lions in? Uh, we have received a few of these animals, um, but normally we go on ahead and we're able to give them off to other organizations. So, um, you know, we work with other organizations like different marine mammal care centers to be able to send them off to help them out the best that we can. We actually specialize more in sea turtle rescue here. Uh, we're one of the, the main sea turtle rescue places, but we'd also try to make sure that we're able to, to be as responsible and, and take care of the animals that we, that we can. Um, and so seals, and sea lions are better suited at these marine mammal care center, but sea turtles are definitely a little bit more of our speciality here. Now, we do have an animal hospital here, which is how we can take care of these animals. Um, and believe it or not, we use this animal hospital mainly to take care of our animals here. We have over 12,000 animals, and so it's used a lot of times for daily care of our animals. And so here's a great picture of one of our vet technicians really kind of getting a chance to open up Parker's mouth right there to see, does Parker have any cavities? How does his teeth look, right? Now, with sea lions here, if you can see, they actually have black teeth. 
And though that may seem gross, that's actually a good thing. That's good bacteria that's on their teeth right there to keep them happy and healthy. So we do a lot of preventative care here at the aquarium, and we use our animal hospital to do a lot of different checkups, dental cares, surgeries, everything that you can think of about how you would go to the doctor and dentist to feel better. We have that all here at the aquarium with our Molina Animal Care Center. And sea turtles are just um, pretty much one of the few exceptions that we will take from the wild if it happens to be within our particular range. Um, there's lots of different rescue centers that specialize in different types of animal care, and we are just one of that larger network. All right, friends, these are fantastic questions. Thank you so very much for all of your questions and comments. If you do have any further ones, we'd love to be able to hear from you. Feel free to go on ahead and email us at live at LBAOP, and we'd be happy to answer any additional questions that you might have. But otherwise, teachers, if you happen to be watching, we'd love to have your numbers just so that way we can make sure that we can get a better understanding of the impact of our programs and how we can prioritize. So to go on ahead text that number right on in we'd love to hear from you thank you so very much everyone and have a great weekend so long